Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Environmental Law Institute's webinar. My name is Madison Calhoun, and I'm the Senior Manager of Educational Programs here at ELI. Each summer, ELI convenes a complimentary summer school series introducing participants to the foundational elements of environmental law. This year, we've decided to follow up our summer school series with a special fall semester and spring semester bonus edition. So today's program is our fall bonus webinar on human rights and the environment. We're so excited to have you joining us this afternoon or at whatever time it might be in your location. If you did not watch our 2024 summer school series, you can find all of the recordings on Eli's summer school webpage or on our YouTube channel. We'll drop a link to those in the chat so you can check them out. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank our wonderful speakers for taking the time to join us today. We so appreciate their time and their excitement about this new topic. Today's event will be recorded and posted to the ELI website within a few business days of the program. So if you're unable to view the entire webinar, be sure to check out the event webpage to see the entire recording. We will be taking audience questions at the end of the program, so please feel free to put your questions in Zoom's Q&A box as soon as you think of them. There's no need to wait until the end of the program. While the chat will be open for you to post observations throughout the webinar, please put any questions that you wish for our speakers to address in the Q&A box rather than the chat. I'll now go ahead and turn things over to our wonderful moderator, Christine Perry. Christine is a staff attorney committed to advancing human rights in the environmental context with a particular focus on gender and disability. She works primarily on international issues with a focus on Latin America. She has experience in judicial training on deforestation issues in Colombia, environmental defenders, environmental crimes in Peru, migration with dignity, as well as enforcement issues more broadly. Christine also manages ELI's pro bono clearinghouse, Christine holds a JD from the Ohio State University College of Law and a BA in Spanish and Creative Writing from Denison University. She's admitted to practice in Ohio and is a member of the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment. She's also an adjunct professor with the American University School of International Service. I will hand things over to you, Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madison. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today. As Madison said, this is a very special edition of our summer school that today we will be talking about the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, and so what we'll do is we're going to start off with a conversation between me and our esteemed guest, and then we're going to open it up for quite a bit of time for questions from the audience. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Marcos Oriana. He is the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. He is also an adjunct professor at the American University Washington College of Law, where he teaches on the law, on human rights, and the environment. His practice as a legal advisor has included work with the United Nations agencies, governments, and non-governmental organizations. His practice as climate negotiator has included work representing the eight nation independent association of Latin America and Caribbean in the negotiations of the Paris Agreement on climate change and the modalities of its facilitation and compliance mechanism. He has also served as a legal advisor to the presidency of the 25th conference of the parties of the UN framework convention on climate change. He has appeared before several international courts and tribunals, including the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, and the World Trade Organization. He has extensive experience working with civil society around the world on issues concerning global environmental justice. He is the inaugural director of the Environment and Human Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. Previously, he directed the trade and human rights programs at the Center for International Environmental Law, and he co-chaired the UN Environment Program's Civil Society Forum. At the Washington College of Law, he has offered several international legal courses, including Law of the Sea, Law of International Organizations, International Investment Law, International Trade in the Environment, and International Law. He has also lectured in the prominent universities, prominent universities around the world, including Melbourne, Pretoria, Geneva, George Washington, and Guadalajara. He was a fellow at the University of Cambridge, visiting scholar with the Environmental Law Institute, and instructor professor of international law at La Universidad de Delca, Chile. We are so pleased to have you here with us today, and I am going to turn it over to you to tell us a little bit more about your work. 
Thank you very much, Christine. It's my real pleasure to uh, join you this uh, this midday on a on a on a Monday um, of October. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so, a couple of reflections on on my current work as a United Nations Special Rapporteur on on toxics and, and human rights. This is a special procedure of the United Nations Human Rights Council. These uh, special procedures have been described as the eyes and ears of the Council, so a way to connect uh, with reality. And in the case of the mandate that has been conferred to me, in connection with hazardous substances. And, and wastes. It is a monitoring and reporting mandate <clears throat> that has a, a global scope. It was created back in, in 1995 uh, at the initiative of the African group, uh, the then uh, UN Commission on Human Rights, which later became or was transformed into the UN Human Rights Council. At the time it was created, it was quite controversial uh, because it focused on the transboundary movements of hazardous wastes. So largely the concern that hazardous wastes were being generated in the global north, then shipped and dumped in the global south. The global environmental injustice of this is evident. The human rights implications are uh, severe for the enjoyment of the right to life, the right to health, the right to food, the right to water. And now that we have a new right uh, recognized at the global level, the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Uh, a couple of tools that the uh, mandate on toxics and human rights as other special procedures of the Council deploy in order to carry out our tasks. Well, uh, country visits. Uh, I spent um, a week in, in Kyiv in Ukraine recently, for example, uh, looking at issues of the environmental impacts of armed conflict um, and so questions of uh, asbestos uh, questions of, of lead, questions of unexplored munitions, and also issues concerning the electric grid and the, 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 the risks and challenges uh, posed by uh, radioactive, um, by nuclear energy and potential radioactive contamination. Just a sense of or a flavor of, 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 of a country visit. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm heading to uh, Samoa on an official country visit in the in the Pacific, where I'll be looking at um, the challenges that small islands uh, like Samoa face in regards to uh, the global plastic pollution threat. Uh, as, as you may know, uh, there are uh, continent-sized islands of plastic floating in the Pacific, two of them, uh, some say three. Uh, <clears throat> more than that, plastics has become a, a global threat to human rights in all its stage, in all its stages, uh, the pollution of uh, extracting uh, the um, hydrocarbons, uh, so the petrochemical industry, the fence line communities that live next to the petrochemical facilities, um, the shipping of plastic pellets, some of you may remember or have heard about the X press pearl, this vessel that uh, capsized, caught fire on the beaches of Sri Lanka and then contaminated the beaches. And certainly waste, waste management. Uh, uh, a big element of this are the chemicals that are added to plastics uh, so that, uh, for example, they may be flexible or, or they may have colors. Uh, by some studies, there are hundreds of chemicals added. Many of them are hazardous. Many of them have not been studied. And, and so it's not just a, an issue of waste, which it is, but it's also an issue of and aggravating the chemical pollution of our planet. Um, so this, this is a tool of conducting country visits. Uh, another tool that the, uh, as mandate holder, uh, as a special procedure, I use are, are letters, sending letters to governments, also to companies at times in the United States, uh, or to the United States rather, I've sent letters regarding PFAS contamination. Some of you may have heard about PFAS, also called forever chemicals, because they are they don't degrade or very hard to degrade. They're pers highly persistent. They're very hard to destroy even. Um, they're ubiquitous. They're used in a, in a range of applications from clothing to uh, fire foams to cooking ware and etc. 
uh, and they have uh, contaminated uh, various uh, areas where they are produced, such as in Cape Fear in North Carolina. So I have sent letters to the companies involved, DuPont, Dow, uh, now Dow, uh, Kimors uh, uh, sent letters to the United States, also to the Netherlands that was exporting PFAS waste to the United States. Uh, and so this gives a sense of, uh, of the tools and, and the work. Uh, other letters, I mean, there are many letters because there are many cases, it's a, it's a global mandate. Uh, but a couple of highlights, I, I think, just to give a sense of, of, of the work, letters concerning uh, the responsibility of Sweden for the export of transfer of hazardous wastes that were eventually dumped in northern Chile, in Arica. Um, the city has uh, been growing and um, this is now becoming a, 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 a huge public health catastrophe there. So the, there, there's that. There's letters I've sent to the European Parliament, also to Germany, and uh, regarding the export of pesticides that uh, are restricted or prohibited for use in the European Union because they are dangerous to the environment and human health but nevertheless allowed for export to um, developing countries. And so this is a form of modern day exploitation where people in the fields of the global South, um, often children, women uh, are exposed to, to hazardous substances. Uh, another tool that I should definitely mention are the, is the elaboration of uh, thematic reports. I, I, I report to the Human Rights Council in September, to the UN General Assembly in October. I'm heading to New York uh, next week to UN headquarters to present my new report on gender and toxics, which uh, examines the disproportionate impacts and burdens that uh, especially women and girls uh, uh, endure because of, of toxics, uh, either because of um, um, the physiology, so the, the, the reproductive uh, organs and systems uh, being more susceptible to um, uh, certain chemicals, but also because of work they do, or because of products that are marketed to them, uh, such as uh, mercury in cosmetics uh, to make uh, skin appear lighter. Uh, so this is a thematic report that looks comprehensively at, uh, at issues of, of gender and, and toxics. Um, one last tool that I should mention is uh, engaging in negotiations or in conferences of the parties. So, so environmental diplomacy where chemicals and wastes are discussed. Last week, for example, I appeared remotely before the Marine Environment Protection Committee of the International Maritime Organization that is discussing the issues of ship recycling. And that sounds like a positive term, but uh, there are thousands of ships that are ending uh, their, their useful life and they're being dismantled by usually poor migrant workers lacking uh, capacities, lacking uh, protective equipment um, in, in yards that are not contained. And, and, and as we know, vessels, they carry a significant amount of hazardous waste. And so this is one of the biggest transfers of hazardous waste from the global north to the global south and it's impacting the workers local communities but also the the global environment because many of these substances are persistent and capable of long range transport and they're being released into the marine environment so that gives a, a sense of, of negotiations and how international agreements uh, work. Uh, so looking at gaps and shortcomings, also developments in international agreements, uh, it gives a sense of how human rights and environment comes to come together and the work of, uh, of a special rapporteur. M much more could be said, of course, but I think that gives you a, a bit of a highlight. Thank you very much for that overview. And we're going to um, jump back in, in just a little bit. But before we start our specific questions, I want to contextualize for our audience the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment and give a little background of what's happened recently on the world stage. So in 2021, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution recognizing the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And this was really big news at the time and still is. 
And then following that in 2022, the UN General Assembly recognized this right as well. And I'd like to contextualize this for our audience that this did not happen overnight, not happen in a vacuum, that this was the result of tireless work by civil society organizations, by indigenous communities and leaders, as well as several states that really took up the mantle to help lead this charge for this recognition, that this was a very collaborative push for the recognition of a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, recognizing this right as a human right, um, and that this right contains both substantive and procedural rights, which is important to note that when looking at the substantive rights contained within the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, we're talking about safe climate, clean air, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, safe, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainable food, non-toxic environment. However, to access this bundle of rights contained within the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, we have to have also the procedural rights, which may include, which do include access to information, public participation, our communities and individuals able to participate in the decision-making process? Do they have the information to participate and have their voices heard throughout this process? And if their rights are violated at some point, do they have access to justice? Do they have a recourse to help make this right, whatever wrongs have been done to them? So you cannot have this right without both the substantive and the procedural rights involved in a the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And now looking back to your work, Dr. Oriano, Dr. Oriana, we'd like to know, how have you seen this right operate, operationalized in your work? Yeah, thanks, Christine. So a, a couple of reflections on, on, on the right to a healthy environment for short and how it um, operationalizes in, in my work. So as, as rapporteur on toxics and human rights, I engage um, several internationally protected human rights. And I mentioned a few, right to health, right to life, right to property, right to housing, right to private life right to water, right to food, um, right to uh, culture, among others, self-determination, among others. Uh, and, and so on the basis of those, um, I, uh, that, that is the anchor, as it were, normatively, that uh, enables uh, the kind of monitoring and reporting that, uh, that I do on toxics, on, on hazardous substances and, and wastes. Now, with the rec global recognition of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, there's yet another right in this arsenal of tools that can be brought into the uh, the, the the analysis. Now, a couple of challenges in operationalization. Some, including myself, have argued that the right to a healthy environment operates a bit like an umbrella that brings together content on human rights and the environment that has been identified through various decades of um, discussions, analysis, pronouncements, jurisprudence, uh, and so forth. And so in that sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a synthesis, right, that also acts as a capstone for dealing with novel issues. Uh, you were mentioning about procedural dimensions, substantive uh, dimensions. Let me reflect on that for a moment. Um, so access to information, participation, access to remedies. Uh, when it comes to information, you know, people have a right to know what is going on in their communities. Is it uh, the, um, uh, for example, toxic emissions released into their environment? Uh, these are fundamental issues. And, and yet there are a number of countries around the world that still do not have tools for informing the population about releases of chemicals and, and wastes into their communities. Without that information, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for regulators to assess risks, to define priorities, 
to take preventative action, to enforce the law. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for communities to protect themselves, to advocate, to mobilize, to participate in decision making. Um, and it is also very difficult for businesses to uh, compete in a level playing field because there may be unscrupulous operators that uh, tend to cut corners and gain an, a competitive advantage in the marketplace by um, emitting more than what's allowed and putting people at risk. That gives you a sense of when we talk about procedural dimensions and access to information, it is also substantive in that sense. It's so there's a procedural dimension in that, that it is enabling good environmental policy, but it uh, the right to information is a right upon itself. Uh, similarly, when we talk about guarantees of freedom of assembly and freedom of expression, um, and when we talk about the security of person, uh, we talk about environmental and human rights defenders uh, and violence, harassment, intimidation, um, the examples and cases of uh, environmentalists uh, assassinated around the world are um, dramatic and is something that uh, brings the human rights and the environment focus on, on a very sharp uh, light. Uh, but it's not all, all process. Uh, I think many countries and even the international community as a whole, we have become quite comfortable with process. We in the face of a project, we assess, we determine possible risks, we try to identify mitigation action, mitigating uh, uh, action, and um, and then the project is usually allowed and it goes forward, despite it having impacts, adverse impacts, and despite be people being displaced, despite the destruction of the natural environment, all because processes have been in have been uh, observed. And that is where the substantive dimensions of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment uh, are, are very important. So because it's not just about process. Having clean air to breathe is not just about having information on what pollutants are allowed to be spewed out by factories or, or what is the level of uh, uh, pollutants in, in the water. Uh, having clean water to drink means having just what it says, clean water to drink. And that that is often that nuance or what is a fundamental point is often lost in the administrative state that uh, we uh, live where um, formal realities of regulation often replace the uh, lived experiences of people. And so the legally, an operation, a business, an industry may be operating in compliance with the law established in a country. And then in reality, the law may be wholly inadequate to provide for substantive uh, respect of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Uh, a clear example of this is in connection with uh, sacrifice zones. This is a term that uh, was coined uh, uh, with the uh, nuclear experimentation that rendered uh, territories uninhabitable. Um, on this, just last Friday, I was on a program, an extended uh, interactive dialogue uh, hosted by the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, I connected remotely to that, that examined the impact, um, the adverse impacts of uh, nuclear testing by the United States in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And, and let's recall that uh, over a number of years, the United States detonated dozens of um, heavy nuclear weapons. And uh, there has been inadequate uh, reparations, inadequate compensation, inadequate health care. The, the impacts, it's not just a matter of the past, it's a lived reality till today. Contamination is still present in some of the uh, islands of the atoll. And so the, the legacy of nuclear contamination uh, 
has direct implications for the right to a healthy environment. It's also seen in its substantive dimension and in connection with sacrifice zones. Now, sacrifice zones, the concept has expanded to also encompass areas that are so polluted that a life of dignity becomes uh, very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, they represent a systematic denial of human rights, often because people are marginalized, discriminated upon, um, and, uh, and governments favor industry over the rights of uh, individuals and, and groups. L lastly, sacrifice zones, we're seeing that also in the context of climate change uh, threats today as uh, certain small islands uh, face the risk of becoming uninhabitable because of climate change impacts and the loss of, such as the loss of clean water or fresh water associated to them. So, so just to round up, the, the substantive dimensions of the right to a healthy environment cannot be understated. They, they, they deserve importance just as procedural aspects do. Thank you for that. And just a reminder to our audience, please put any questions you have in the Q&A box. And now I'm going to ask you to bring out your crystal ball, which I know is a little bit tricky, but looking forward, where do you see this right advancing or any forecast in the next 10 years, any trends that you might think of when you think of the right to a healthy environment in the context of your work? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, so. Uh... One area that I think is uh, ripe for um, for progress is on issues concerning justiciability of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. So there are a number, number of countries that have incorporated this right into their constitutions, national constitutions. They're also at the subnational level, there are uh, states, such as in the United States, there are states in the, in the Union that have um, amended their constitutions to incorporate the right to a healthy environment. The number of countries, uh, the, the, the last I, I saw was 122 countries out of 190 plus, uh, 123 perhaps. So that's that's a sizable number. Now, how did that process come about? Some speak to the so-called environmental rights revolution. So if we look back in time, and some of you may be familiar with the 1972 UN Conference on the Human Environment, this was the first time that the United Nations came together, that the international community came together to discuss about environmental issues having a global significance. And so before that, it wasn't in the imagination, it wasn't in the narrative, people just didn't think about it. Sure, there were environmental issues sometimes concerning natural resources or the nuisance, but they were largely domestic or local. Uh, this was the first time that the human environment became an issue of uh, concern and attention at the global level because of transboundary pollution, acid rain, loss of species, etc. Um, as a result of that conference, and countries began to change their fundamental norms, the, their constitutions. And, and so that's how we have arrived to this uh, 100 plus countries that today have this right enshrined in their constitutions. Now, the formulations vary. Some countries speak about a healthy environment, others about a sustainable environment, others bring in biodiversity, others bring in the precautionary principle. We're in situations of uncertainty, scientific uncertainty. Uh, others uh, speak about um, programmatic uh, rights. And so this is the point I want to focus for a moment. Programmatic rights are aspirations. So they guide government policy, but they don't allow individuals or groups to go to court to look to seek remedies and to uh, seek accountability for violation of the right. Instead, they focus on what the government should be doing. And in that sense, they have been described as um, guiding principles. So I, I think one key challenge here, and we can see this perhaps in the next 10 years, is for those countries that do not have a 
justiciable construct of the right in their constitution to continue to progress and uh, establish a right of action for individuals to access justice in the courts uh, when uh, the right to a healthy environment is is threatened. I think that's a that's a big element in in the in the drive towards accountability. I know we're tight on time, but I'll, I thought I'd mention two other things. One is the connection between the right to a healthy environment and ecosystem services. So the connection between biodiversity and human rights has not been studied very much. There are some reports that look into this. And one of the big issues is what is often described as fortress conservation, which is you know, a, an organization or a government coming in, setting the boundaries of a protected area, be it a national park or otherwise. And then the people that live there they are either displaced or they are restricted in their use of the land and territory in ways that may affect their cultural rights. And so fortress conservation uh, as a driver of human rights abuse has been receiving uh, increasing attention because conservation in order to be sustainable, uh, there needs to be a dialogue between humans and the uh, government authorities that want to establish a, a protection. Um, otherwise, it, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, that's been demonstrated in practice so many times. Uh, but going beyond fortress conservation, the recognition that humans depend on nature fundamentally for uh, thriving in our economies, in our culture, so that human civilization depends on ecosystem services. So this interdependence is something that uh, I think can, the right to a healthy environment can take forward both in our ability to think, create our awareness, human awareness, our ability to think creatively in ways to protect nature and protect humans as a result. And so that interdependence is something that I, I, I see will, uh, or rather forecast may <laughs> um, be more prominent in the, in the next 10 years. And, and the last point, also noting that the time is tight, concerns uh, standards. So environmental standards, uh, as uh, from that conference that I mentioned in 1972, big element of uh, environmental laws approach has been to set quality standards or emission standards. How much uh, mercury is allowed in human blood? How much um, nitrous oxides can be emitted by a coal fire power plant and so forth? And, and, and then the command and control, the, the regulator will inspect and monitor and it will enforce the law if there's non-compliance. Well, this model make several assumptions. One is that the state, the government, is capable, has the capacity to monitor and enforce. And that is a fiction in so many countries. And so this model begins to break down. But another assumption is that the, there is sufficient information to set standards at levels that provide protection. And this is often another fiction because standards are often set at levels in which industry can operate easily or can compete in international markets without sufficient regard to the health of neighboring communities that may be affect, adversely affected. And so the issue of standards from a human rights-based approach will come, I would forecast and perhaps you know expect even that they will come under scrutiny because where standards are not robust then the result is legitimized human rights abuse and that from a human rights perspective is uh, untenable and unacceptable and so we see a tension there between existing models of environmental law and the human rights imperative of leaving no one behind and securing an environment that is clean, healthy, and sustainable for all. Thank you. 
And now we're going to turn a bit to some of our audience questions. I'm going to combine two of these. Um, the first is, can you touch on the difference between a binding right and something that's been recognized? How is this enforceable? And looking at that, what is the most effective role going forward for the UN to advance this right in a human rights context? Thanks. So, so thinking about the the, the first question, Christine, uh, the um, the structure of um, international law uh, contemplates various uh, various actors and and various sources of law, and and this is important in order to understand what is binding and then what is non-binding. Now, there are various theories as to how non-binding may have seeds of bindingness and in any event may they may uh, uh, pose uh, um, considerations of um, reasonable expectations and they may have a soft power that is in, is nevertheless binding. So, so there's there's interesting conceptual debate and theories about this. But classical international lawyers will dis distinguish between binding law uh, anchored in the sources of international law that have been laid out in Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, which rather than laying out a catalog of binding law, it lays out what are the sources of law that the ICJ for the acronym will use in deciding cases. Um, and so among those binding sources of law are treaties, international treaties, you know, the, uh, also international customary law. I, I, I won't develop the, the point too much further, but only to point out that these sources, so w when a right and an obligation is found in a treaty, it is uh, considered to be binding uh, but that also depends on the way that the treaty is formulated, because, for example, the Paris Agreement on, on, under the UN Framework Convention on, on Climate Change is a binding treaty, but several of its provisions are drafted in non-binding terms. And so in that sense, you can find non-binding provisions in, in binding instruments. And so it, it comes down to a case by case analysis of of the norm in question when it comes to the uh and this is all at the level of international law and I'll come back to the issue of internal law in a minute uh when it comes to the right way clean healthy and sustainable environment there are various considerations here there are several international treaties that uh, protect rights whose enjoyment is uh, contingent upon a clean environment. And so um, it is by way of interpretation, it is quite possible to find that the right to a healthy environment is binding, say under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, because uh, several of the rights enshrined therein are only capable of being enjoyed in a healthy environment or with respect to the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, um, is at uh, what is the level of uh, consensus in the international community in regards to this right. So the proclamation, the resolution by the UN General Assembly that recognizes this right. Uh, so no votes against, a couple abstentions. Uh, all in all, one of the resolutions of the General Assembly concerning uh, human rights that has attracted significant consensus. Some would argue that this is evidence of the right having entered the realm of customary law, international customary law, also on account of state practice. So the fact that more than 120 national constitutions have enshrined this state speaks to its binding character by virtue of the crystallization of international customary law. 
some countries will oppose this reading and say like, uh, a general assembly resolution is non-binding and so it cannot establish or create a new right um, and so the debate goes it, it seems that uh, that um, that the fact that uh, uh, more and more states are enshrining this right in their national constitutions and their na international proclamation is giving its significant strength to the argument that uh, that international custom is crystallizing in this area. Again, this is all at the level of international law. At the level of internal law, so within the state, within a country, the constitution is the law of the land, and so the recognition of the right within that instrument means that the right is binding in that sense. Now, it may or not be justiciable in the sense of enabling an individual or group to go to court to vindicate it. That's the distinction I was drawing earlier between so-called programmatic rights and justiciable rights. Thank you for that distinction. And then looking to the UN's role, how do you see the UN advancing the right to a healthy environment? Well, there's various ways. The, 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 the standard setting process by the United Nations is an important one. And so the, um, the resolutions by first the Human Rights Council and more recently in 2022, the, the, the General Assembly on the right to a healthy environment um, are, are quite important in that process. And But it's not a process that ends in time. It's a process that, that continues. And so further clarification of the rights um, uh, nature and scope um, are important. I, th I think that at this time, there is a clear understanding of cer certain core components of, of the right, um, but there needs to be more education, more dissemination, more outreach and further discussion so that implementation can take into account the um, the challenges that as humanity we are facing in respect of uh, of climate change, of toxic pollution, of, of biodiversity. Uh, so I think this is an important point to underscore because it is not a question of standard setting for the sake of developing additional norms and, and standards as if that were a goal in itself. It is rather to enable us humans to thrive on this planet and to protect it. And we are faced with existential crisis, uh, with an existential triple crisis where climate change, if left unabated, will render this planet uninhabitable. Toxic pollution is threatening to undermine some of the defining features of our human identity, uh, our intelligence, our ability to reproduce, our health, uh, and biodiversity, biodiversity ecosystem services are the, the basis for human civilization. And so we're talking about the development standards that are central for, um, hu for life, for human life on the planet as we know it, and also for, for the life of countless other uh, species uh, that inhabit uh, this earth. Uh, so that's one one aspect I would say of uh, of standard setting and, and and second I would say on on operations, the United Nations may take this right and and incorporate it more broadly into the work it does. So I was mentioning uh, er earlier about uh, the situation in Ukraine <clears throat> uh, in response to Russian aggression. In 2022, the Human Rights Council set up a monitoring, a human rights monitoring mission. Now, this mission encompasses a, a number of rights. No? It encompasses the, the international catalog of, of rights. Now, does it encompass and does it do work on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment? Well, so far it hasn't. And, and why not? Well, there are other UN entities present in Ukraine conducting some research on, on this, uh, but also because there is still 
um, some road to, and some ways to, um, for the United Nations itself to um, become more familiar, become more comfortable with addressing the right to a healthy environment in its in its operations, and and so eventually I could anticipate or expect that the uh, monit the human rights monitoring mission in the Ukraine may uh, issue a report that looks at. Um, the environmental uh, dimensions of uh, of uh, of its monitoring, so that that gives you an example of um, of the kinds of considerations and issues that the United Nations itself is facing when it comes to uh, the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Thank you. And then looking at that question, looking beyond the UN. What role do others play in advancing this right? I know that you've worked on environmental justice. What role do communities, civil society organizations, indigenous peoples play in advancing this right? Yeah, no, thanks for, for that question. So broadly speaking, the realization of human rights is a shared responsibility in society and it is incumbent upon all organs of society to cooperate and do what they can in order to uh, achieve the realization of, of human rights. Now, that being said, their primary responsibility is of states. States have duties uh, to respect and protect rights and, and to fulfill rights. They have the duty not to take action that would harm human rights. They have the duty to take action when it comes to the foreseeable impacts <clears throat> of um, the the uh, the actions of third parties such as businesses so that means for example regulating adequately uh, it means monitoring effectively it means enforcing the laws um, it means not being a witness or, or a bystander it means being a protagonist and taking action uh, they all states also have uh, obligations to fulfill rights so to set up programs and plans and policies and and the, the budgets and institutions and that are needed for the realization of rights. These are the primary responsibilities. Uh, now that is not to say that others do not have responsibilities. And so the, the responsibilities of businesses for respecting human rights has received, received significant attention in the uh, last few years, I would say, last couple of decades, because in reality, we're seeing in numerous situations where people suffer, not because of what the government does, but because of what businesses do. And that then leads to questions of accountability and, and also questions of governance and gaps in governance. Um, now, when it comes to civil society and indigenous peoples, stakeholders, right holders. I would say that in the non-governmental organizations play a very important role in shedding light, in visibility, in documenting. In a, Without the work of NGOs, of civil society or more broadly, um, human rights work would be very difficult because it is human, it is human rights NGOs, environmental NGOs that are in the field that are documenting cases of abuse, that are talking to people and that are bringing those issues to public attention. And that enables then um, uh, focused discussions and changes in, in policies where, where needed and, and appropriate. One last aspect of this question that I wish, wish to highlight is that there I, I devoted one of my thematic reports to the issue of the right to the issue of the right to science and dealt in that context with disinformation and misinformation and attacks against science and attacks against scientists for profit. So there are firms that specialize in spreading disinformation because uncertainty means paralysis and the status quo is very profitable to many uh, vested interests. So when it comes to disinformation, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to uh, disinformation, there is, uh, and say plastics and recycling, who came up with this idea of plastic recycling? Was it, uh, 
Was it Greenpeace? Was it the Environmental Law Institute? Uh, was it environmental NGOs? No. This has been uh, unveiled by investigative reporting of the NPR, the National Public Radio in the United States, that have traced this back to the plastics industry in the knowledge that there is no capacity for adequate plastic recycling, more than 90% of plastics go to waste, and that plastics, most plastics cannot be recycled because they are either poor quality or they have chemicals that uh, would mean, uh, you know, concentration of hazardous uh, substances. And so this level of disinformation what it intends is to transfer responsibilities from the polluter towards the individual. And so at one level, yes, we can all agree and uh, that um, responsibilities is for human rights realization are shared and the right to a healthy environment depends on everyone coming together. But let's not let that approach mask or obscure the fact that the primary responsibility is with government and that polluters bear the responsibility for prevention and for cleaning up. And they should not be allowed to transfer that responsibility to individuals. Thank you. And I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. And I see that people are very interested in the rights of nature and how this intersects with the right to a healthy environment and also with your mandate. Could you explore that a bit? Sure, the, the issue of, uh, of rights of nature uh, are also receiving uh, significant attention uh, in the international sphere. I, I would make a couple of points. One is international human rights law concerns the rights of humans. No? And so in that sense, it's, markedly anthropocentric. The right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is a human right. And in that sense, it's conceptually different from the rights of nature or the rights of animals or, 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 or otherwise. Now that doesn't, that's first. Second, that does not mean that the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment uh, has nothing to do with nature or is, is, is separate from, as it were, or, or, or sees individuals or humans separate from nature. In order to protect the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, the autonomous, the, the, the elements of the natural world may need to be protected. And so there is a synergy there between the rights of nature as a conceptual framework and the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Now, now that synergy, for example, has been explored <clears throat> by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in an advisory opinion that it issued uh, several years ago in 2017 that uh, considered that the first, that the right to a healthy environment is an autonomous right that it doesn't depend on other rights. Um, secondly, that it protects the uh, elements of, uh, of the natural environment. Uh, and so this, this is important because it allows um, for the jurisprudence to, to build. Um, let me give you a third, let me give you a, an example. I, I did a country visit to Ecuador re recently. Some of you may be familiar with Ecuador and the situation in, in the Yasuni National Park, one of the most mega biodiverse areas on the planet. Uh, in the terms of Ecuador's national constitution, there was a referendum whereby the whole country voted uh, on the question of whether to leave uh, the oil underneath the hydrocarbons underneath uh, the Yasuni National Park on the ground or, or otherwise, or to exploit them. And the, the nation voted to keep the hydrocarbons underground. Now, what does that say about the right to a healthy environment, about the rights of nature coming together in connection with the bi mega biodiversity in the park, but also in connection with the rights of indigenous peoples living in isolation. So not connected with society, also living in the area, in their traditional territories. 
And in connection with the imperative and challenge of decarbonization of energy matrices that are needed in order for us to keep within the uh, Paris Agreement on climate change uh, uh, global objectives of uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Without that, without that decarbonization, and without those safeguards and safe rails to, in the Paris Agreement, the human rights impacts of climate change are going to become much more severe. Thank you. And I would like to give you a minute or so if you have any final thoughts, any parting words of wisdom for our audience before I turn it over to Madison. Well, I wish to thank the Environmental Law Institute for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, Today and this day of of October fall, the, as the leaves are are falling, we're, I think I'm reminded that in order for us to have seasons, we need a healthy planet. Uh, for us to uh, thrive in this in this world, we need a healthy planet. We're facing a, a triple planetary crisis of unprecedented proportions. This is uncharted territory for humanity, and so the while the challenges uh, are are huge, we as humanity, I, I have faith and trust that uh, that we may find the tools in order to to overcome it. But that also depends on on creative thinking. And there, I I challenge you in a way to think about the right to a healthy environment and think about what what we can do to make it a reality for all. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful speaking with you today, Madison. Thanks so much, Christine and Dr. Oriana, for joining us today. We so appreciate both of you taking the time and energy to make this program happen. Thank you as well to our audience for your time and your engagement. Um, we so appreciate all of your questions. If you missed any part of today's webinar, the recording will be available on the event webpage and on ELI's YouTube page within a few business days. If you enjoyed this program, we encourage you to check out ELI membership to gain full access to all of our educational programming. You can find all of the information about that at ELI.org. And with that, I'll bring today's webinar to a close. Thank you again, everyone, and we hope you have a wonderful day.